did not pick those up and you would like one, would you please slip up your hand and the ushers will make sure we get you a copy of those notes. Gentlemen, would you help me here, please? Daniel. Also, we have two gifts for you this morning. Please pick one up if you haven't already done so. We're going to start a journey this morning. I'm not exactly sure how long it's going to take, but we're going to, we're going to walk through a journey of faith from, from atheist to committed believer, and nobody gets from point A to point B in one step. It's a process, and we're going to use the example of Lee Strobel and his, his journey, and I believe that as we watch his journey unfold over these next several weeks, you'll all, we'll all find ourselves relating to some aspects of it. So the first is a short book with some questions and answers that Lee had to struggle with his, in his own journey. And the other we've been passing out over the last week, if you haven't already picked one up, it's Palm Sunday to Easter, and it evaluates through maps and scriptures what, how Jesus chose to spend his last week on earth before his sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection. Acts chapter 8, if you'll join me there. Lee Strobel in the early 80s, late 70s and early 80s, was the legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. He had won many awards for his skill at being an investigative journalist, exposing corruption in Chicago and in other places. I know it surprises you to realize there's corruption in Chicago and other places. But Lee was a master at exposing that. He put his skills to work in order to, when his wife Leslie came to Christ in, in I think it was 1980, uh, Lee was an atheist. And he really believed that, that Leslie had been deluded and deceived. So he decided to put his skills as an investigative journalist to, to uh, work to save Leslie from Christianity uh, by exposing it as either just religious imagination or manipulation. We may start from different points in our own journey of faith and trying to honestly evaluate the claims of Christ. But the reality is we all have some place. In long that journey... When Lee started, which was originally a case against Christ, it didn't take him learned, long to realize that his case against Christ was actually uh, turned into something he didn't expect. And he would have to face some inconvenient truths along that journey. We're going to show you a brief excerpt uh, of the movie. And by the way, at the end of this journey, we're going to show the movie to the community, and I hope you'll be a part of that. But we're going to show you uh, a little clip of how Lee was struggling with the information he was finding. What are you doing here? I thought you were banished. <laughs> hey. What's the matter? Your people and your God, you just, you know, you talk in circles, you offer... You offer just enough evidence, but never enough to be conclusive. And you fill in all the gaps with, oh, well, yeah, you just got to have faith. It's a bunch of nonsense. You are really irritating. You know that? <sighs> don't start with me, Kenny. You don't waste a lick of time bragging to all of us how great a reporter you are. So why can't you put up or shut up on this story? What are you even talking about? Here's where the chili meets the cheese, my friend. One of my heroes was C.S. Lewis, a man who began as a skeptic, much like yourself. At the end of his journey, you know what he said? He said, if Christianity is false, it's of zero importance. But if it's true, there's nothing more important in the entire universe. So you want your wife back? Well, hey, guess what? People in hell want ice water. Not everybody gets everything they want. Stop blaming me and the church and God. And do your job. Stack up the evidence, follow the facts, and write the story, win or lose. Stack up the evidence, examine the facts, and write the story, win or lose. We're going to look at some of the facts that Lee stumbled upon, actually he didn't stumble, he started digging. And how through the process 
of taking an objective look at the truths of the gospel, he came to a realization. But I hope that you heard that statement that the other editor, the religious editor of the Chicago Tribune had shared with Lee about C.S. Lewis. He was a skeptic, an agnostic, an educator in England back in the 50s. And he went through his own journey and he made the statement, and I think it's, it's so relevant. If Christianity isn't true, if the claims of Christ are false, then it really has no importance at all. But if, if the claims of Christ are true, then it is of supreme importance. The reality, though, is we don't really, we want some of the claims of Christ to be true, but we struggle with the reality that is, if he is who he said he is, that he is the one that we're going to stand before someday and give an account to. When Lee was confronted about his own prejudice and challenged to follow the facts wherever they led him, this journey began to change his perspective. The first words out of Jesus' mouth after he came, when he was, uh, after he was baptized, he went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil for 40 days. The first word, recorded words we have when he left the desert was repent. Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the word repent could very easily be considered changing your perspective. It literally means change your thinking. And in this journey that Lee was making, and in each of our journeys of faith, we are confronted with very inconvenient truths about ourselves and about God. Lee decided to continue that journey even when he was confronted with those inconvenient truths. My question to you is, are you willing to do the same in your journey? Most people will find on this journey sticking points or barriers They'll run into something that either doesn't make sense or they have trouble processing or transitioning from their comfortable paradigm or perspective to the reality that maybe I was wrong. And they get stuck at those points. Acts chapter 8 is an illustration. We're going to start with that in Acts chapter 8 verse 26. Philip was one of the original deacons of the church of Jerusalem. He was an evangelist that was conducting a revival in the Samaritan villages with great results. And then God said, leave this. Go take a walk in the desert. Your first walkabout, if you will. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip in verse 26 of Acts chapter 8, saying, Arise, go towards the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. What do we know about this Ethiopian so far? He was on a journey of about 2,000 miles from home. But what drew him on that journey? What was going on in his heart? Do we have any clues so far? He wanted to know God. He was up there because he was looking for answers. And he was returning, sitting in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go near and join yourself to his chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah that said, and said, understandest thou what thou readest. It's interesting he was reading Isaiah 53. <sighs> Isaiah is a miniature of the Bible. It's got 66 books, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. The first 39, cha 66 chapters, the first 39 chapters are primarily about judgment and sin. Just as the first 39 books of the Bible are primarily lay the foundation about God's righteousness and man's sinfulness. Chapter 40 of Isaiah begins, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Speak comfortably to Israel. And then the next 27 chapters are about redemption. And right in the middle of that is Isaiah 53. And Isaiah 53 is the book. That says, who hath believed our report, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. There's no beauty that we should desire him. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every man to his own way. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
He was despised and rejected a man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Yet we hid, as it were, our faces from him. We didn't want to deal with that. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him because he hath made his soul an offering for sin. That's the chapter this man was coincidentally reading. And Philip simply asked him, Do you, are you getting this? Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I? The first barrier to belief, I think, is reflected in, I can't believe it. I can't buy it. I can't understand it. I can't grasp it. How can I? I just don't get it. I don't understand. This is usually an obstacle based on our education. It's an intellectual obstacle, ultimately. It, the, the reality of what God is doing and what God has done and what God wants to continue to do in our life, it runs against what we have been taught, our, our natural logic, our natural reason, or our experience, and therefore it becomes probably one of the first barriers in any honest journey of faith. I just don't buy it. I can't grapple with, this is so different than really what I've been taught. I want to be as brief as possible, but I want to just whet your appetite to help you to realize there's so much in our society that contradicts Christ. What do most people do on Easter morning in America? We, 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 especially if we have kids, what are we looking for? Easter bunny and the candy and the Easter eggs. What are most little children looking for on Christmas morning? Santa Claus gifts. These are subtle, and we can say they're harmless, but I'm, I'm telling you that there's so much in our society that we have been taught, and forgive the expression, kind of programmed, so that when we're confronted with the harsh reality that there's a holy God that we're accountable to, the problem with our intellect, the problem with our understanding, the problem with our experiences, the problem with our perspective is they can be manipulated and corrupted. Paul says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. The word complete is plerujo. You are fulfilled in him. Which means all these other things are not fulfilling. They don't have the capacity to fulfill us. Augustine said in the fourth century, God, you've made us for yourself, and the heart of man is restless until it finds its rest in you. But we try to fill that gap in many other things. These, this, our education, our experience, our perspective can be programmed. We, we use the word brainwashing, but I want to tell you that it's not brainwashing, it's brain contaminating. It clouds our ability to see what God has done for us. First Timothy, Paul warns the young pastor Timothy in the church of Ephesus, uh, watch out, beware, avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science. The word science is the Greek word gnostis. And it just basically means knowledge. But oppositions of knowledge that's falsely so-called. We have elevated science. How many of you remember when Daniel preached that message using the ladder? Remember that? We have elevated science as if science were a God. Has science ever been wrong? We elevate the court system and the Supreme Court made a decision so it must be right. Has the Supreme Court ever been wrong? You see, all of these things that we tend in our society to put our trust in do not have a very good track record. Paul told Timothy, don't buy what you're taught just because someone is saying it's true. Look at the facts. Be objective. Follow the facts. Write the story no matter where they go. Paul said, watch out for science, which some professing, which means embracing, have erred concerning the faith. They get off track. They're not able to recognize the path that God wants to take them because, and by the way, is Satan smart? Because Satan, the deceiver, has whispered in their ears and put up these barriers to their belief. So that instead of following the path, the Bible says, Thou wilt show me the path of life in Psalm 16. By the way, that is on the window in the stained glass mirror in Washington, D.C. at the Senate's prayer chamber. 
showing George Washington kneeling in Valley Forge, thou wilt show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. God wants to show us that path. Satan knows that, so he throws these barriers. I can't buy it. I can't believe. Why? Because we've been programmed. Subtly, not overtly, we don't teach, and, and, and our society doesn't necessarily teach yet that there is no God. That's not the message our kids are hearing. But any intelligent person can put two and two together and realize, wait a minute, if I'm an accident... If I can't say Merry Christmas, if, if it's okay to follow the Easter Bunny on Easter Sunday or Santa on, on Christmas morning, but I can't talk about Jesus, and then I go to school and I learn all about evolution, we are subtly saying, well, we're not bold enough to say God is dead or God doesn't exist. We're simply saying God doesn't matter. God doesn't matter. He's not important enough for you to worry about Opposition to science, falsely so-called. Remember Nazi Germany? If you ever get the chance, visit the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., but don't rush. Go and visit what was going on in, in Germany in the 1920s and 30s, and you'll find it was genetics, and it was science. And they, for, de for decades, was programming the German people to believe that people that didn't look Aryan and people didn't come from this were subhuman until they got to the place where Jews and gypsies and people not like them were not even considered human. And that set the science, set the stage for the Holocaust by programming people and people buying into science. Nazi Germany, Joseph Goebbels was the minister of propaganda, and he wrote, propaganda works best when those being manipulated are confident that they are acting on their own free will. I don't want to get too political here because both parties use it with mastery. But don't believe everything you're hearing. Don't believe everything you're seeing. Because propaganda is designed to program our thinking, to draw us to a certain conclusion. So what's the solution to this barrier? How do we knock this barrier down or at least tunnel around it or get, get around it? Isaiah 55 says, Ho, everyone that is thirsty, come you to the waters. He that hath no money, buy without money and without price. Why do you labor for that which cannot satisfy you? What a beautiful picture of people who are seeking truth. People who are seeking. But you see, there's always cheap salesmen who are trying to, try to sell you an alternative. God says, why are you spending money for that which cannot satisfy you? Then it goes on, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy unto our God for he will abundantly pardon. What is God saying here? Look for me. Look honestly, look objectively, but seek and see for yourself. Don't trust your preacher. Don't trust your parents and their faith because you know what? God is nobody's grandfather. This is a personal journey everybody must make. And there's a devil out there and there's a world out there full of doubters and barriers. They're going to throw those barriers up and get you to give up. God says, no, seek me and see for yourself. Jesus put it this way in John. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When Lee was starting this journey, and again, it was a case against Christ. But as he used, as he searched objectively, he had the pros and the cons, and there were plenty of both. He began, real, his, one of his objections was, well, science tells us that we're creatures of chance. And, and, and all these intelligent people, they know. And he started interviewing. He, this is before the internet, by the way. This is in the early 80s. He flew all over the country interviewing the experts in these different fields. He discovered one expert, Dr. Vigo and Joan Olson. He was a de highly decorated medical doctor, many, many degrees and many, many accolades. And, and, and he, the, him and his wife wrote the book, The Agnostic Who Dared Search. And that kind of appealed to Lee. Hey, I'm not the first one making this journey. 
After discovering the truth, he, he resigned his prestigious position and he, became, he prayed and said, God, send me somewhere where there is no Bibles and no missionaries. And God says, go to Bangladesh. He went to Bangladesh. He was a medical doctor and he was a, now a born-again believer. He went and he started hospitals in over 120 different churches. When Lee interviewed him and he said, how could you make that decision? He said, we wouldn't have missed it for the world. Finding the purpose for which God made you and fully persuading it is simply the very best way to live your life. Lee had trouble recognizing, well, maybe he's just a kook. Maybe he's a fluke. Maybe he's an exception to intelligent people who buy the truth of Christ. So he kept his search. He came up with Dr. James Tor, head of nanoscience in Rice University. This man basically builds molecules, genetics research, molecules for living. And he told Lee, I build molecules for living. I cannot begin to tell you how difficult that is, even with all our computers and microbiologies and nanoscience. I can't begin to tell you how difficult it is to build even the rudimentary, easiest parts of molecular life. I stand in awe of God because what he has done through his creation. Only a rookie, he said, who knows nothing about science would say science takes away from faith. If you really, objectively, honestly study science, it will bring you to God. Lee struggled with that. Wait a minute, what about all these scientists? And then he finds honest scientists who said, think, think, think. If we, even if we are follow the evolution and we have evolved to this place where we're involved in genetics and trying to create life ourselves and with all that we know and all that we have we can barely scratch the surface you're wanting me to believe that this was all a chance if we really did evolve what evolved first the eye or the hand the heart or the brain we ha everything had to be perfect for life to sustain itself where did I go? Even with all our technology. He's searching and he's finding people who are challenging his paradigm. Challenging the concept that science and, and perspective and prejudice, by the way. Why is it that people don't want to believe there's a God? What's the real reason? Is Jesus really that threatening? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Love your enemies. What in the world is so threatening about Jesus Christ? Why would he die? If he was God, why would he allow himself to go through that? It does, he is either who he said he is, as C.S. Lewis said, or he's a lunatic or a liar. He cannot be both. And yet in modern Christianity, we, we pick some of what Jesus said. I like that. And some of which he said, it says, Fear not him that's able to destroy the body, but fear him who rather is able to so destroy both body and soul in hell. We don't like that part. If you look at Guinea's Book of World, World Records, you'll find this man, Lionel Luco. He is the world's most successful defense attorney. I think the number was 450 murder cases in a row he won by taking an objective look at the facts. He wrote, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelmingly compelling that it compels acceptance by proof that leaves no room for doubt. If you are objective and have not already been not brainwashed, but brain not washed. <laughs> As Lee, and this is just one of the barriers. We're going to be talking about other barriers, but this was the one that really he started with. I just can't believe this. This concept of faith, it go, I, I've been taught that faith is delusion. Who was it that said religion is the opiate of the masses? Does anyone know who said that? 
Karl Marx. John Lennon took it from him. Not John Lennon, the singer. Lennon, the Russian guy, whoever that guy was. John Lennon, the singer, probably said it too. <laughs> Lee Re and by the way, why did Karl Marx say that? Because Karl Marx was raised a Jew. And then they moved to Germany. And his father came home when Karl was about 13 years old, preparing for his bar mitzvah, and his father said, we're, we're Lutheran now. Why, Papa? Well, we're in Germany now, and it's good for business. Karl Marx was shattered. And he realized religion is just some way to control people, some way to use belief to get ahead in life. And that, that contaminated his thinking, and he's the founder of communism. Lee, however, realized that he was only one of many skeptics who, when they began to honestly seek for the truth, discovered that the truth had been looking for them. Folks, if you get nothing else out of this, get this. If you're honestly looking for God, if you're even open to the reality that God wants a relationship with you, know this, that God put that in your heart and he's looking for you. The woman at the well of Samaria started talking to Jesus about worship and the Samaritan's form of worship. And Jesus said, true worshipers, true seekers, people who are sincerely and honestly looking for a relationship with God, they have to do that in spirit and in truth because the Father is seeking such. God is looking for seekers. Even skeptical, cynical seekers. People who will be honest and objective and actually look and see for themselves. Go back to the Ethiopian. The Ethiopian had been looking for truth. He traveled 2,000 miles from Ethiopia to Jerusalem for one primary reason. It wasn't political. It was, I want to know God. Who put that in his heart? That is crazy. God put that hunger in his heart. The worship of your, the, the Ethiopians and the pagan worship, it didn't satisfy him. And God somehow put in his heart, I love you, I'm seeking you, come here. When he was there, he bought some Old Testament scriptures, particularly the scroll of Isaiah, which, by the way, would have been a fortune in that day, hand copied. And he was reading, and of all the, and by the way, they didn't have paragraphs, they didn't have verses, they didn't have chapters, they didn't even have spaces between the words. They didn't have vowels. If you've ever seen a Hebrew scroll, it is amazing that anyone can find anything in there. And they read it backwards, by the way. He's, he's diligently looking at this, and he just happened to be reading Isaiah 53 when he realized before the end of the day that the one who he was seeking had already been setting things in motion, seeking him. Philip, 20 or 30 miles away, busy, heard the whisper of the Holy Spirit, leave this and go into the middle of nowhere. And he obeyed. He coincidentally, God's Spirit coincidentally led the Ethiopian to be reading a passage about Jesus Christ. Beyond that, he gave him an inquiring mind. Because when, when Philip showed up and said, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I accept some man guide me? He said, what are you reading? He said, the prophet, is he speaking about himself here? That doesn't make sense. And the Bible says, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus Christ. Tell me that's coincidence. That a man from 2,000 miles away would be in the, a particular spot in the desert reading a passage of scripture in the Old Testament, the, probably the clearest picture prophecy of Jesus Christ, one of hundreds, by the way, and another man 30 miles away would hear the Holy Spirit saying, drop what you're doing and go, go take a walk in the middle of the desert. And th those two points would converge at the same time he's reading Isaiah 53. Remember Easter morning? The women came to the grave. The angels were waiting for them. Why were the angels waiting for them? Because they knew these are women who love the Lord and are confused and don't understand what was going on. 
So while they were seeking the Lord, what was God doing? He was setting the stage, saying, I'm seeking you. The angel said, he is not here. He is risen as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. What are, they tell, what are the angels telling them? Investigate for yourself. Objectively examine the evidence. If you look at the bulletin this morning, I put in there a quip. I, I read about a, a, a letter to the editor about Easter, and, and he went to a liberal church where the preacher didn't believe in the resurrection and said the swoon theory that Jesus wasn't really dead. And if you have a chance, I encourage you to read, read it. But in essence, it, the, the, the editor wrote back to this man, well, why don't you do this to your preacher? Why don't you beat him, then nail him to a cross, leave him to hang there for six hours in the hot sun, then put a spear through his, through his heart and then lock him up in an airless tomb for three days to test his theory. Examine the evidence. Jesus came and, and appeared that day later in the afternoon to the disciples who were still locked in locked rooms hiding for fears. They were all there except for Thomas. We know Thomas 2,000 years later as doubting Thomas. He wasn't there when Jesus showed up. And by the way, when the women came back and told the disciples, did they believe? No. When John and Peter went into the empty tomb, did they believe? Well, John did, but Peter didn't believe. You see, this issue of I can't, I can't, I can't. Do you think God understands that? Do you think that God rejects that? Or do you think God says, keep looking? Keep looking. There's more here than meets the eye. Science says seeing is believing. God says believe and I'll show you. Keep looking. Thomas, when the other disciples ex excitedly said, we have seen the Lord, Thomas said, except I see his in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Can I paraphrase this? I just can't buy it. I can't get it. I don't. It was delusional. He was a ghost. That's why he said, I need to handle him. Because they did believe in spirits. It's a mirage. It's a, it's, a, it's a part of the, you want it so bad, you're making it happen. Eight days later, can you imagine how miserable those eight days must have been for Thomas? As he saw the joy on the faces of all the other disciples, but he's still struggling with, I can't, I can't. Jesus went out of his way to come to Thomas. And he singled about and said, Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. What is Jesus saying when he says, reach hither thy finger? What, do you read between the lines what's going on here? Jesus is in the room the first time. He heard everything Thomas had said. Why did he let Thomas stew in his doubt for a week? I don't know exactly. But when Jesus showed up, he knew exactly what Thomas had said. Reach, behold my hands, reach hither your finger, your hand thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. What is he saying to Thomas? Examine the evidence. Seek objectively and honestly, but seek and examine the evidence. The word believing is, comes from, the, it's pistos, it comes from petho. It means be convinced. Look at the evidence, draw a conclusion. Thomas's response was a quick, my Lord and my God. But notice what Jesus said. Because you've seen, you've believed. You have undeniable, tangible evidence in front of you. Blessed are those that have not seen and still believe. Now here's the point. Jesus isn't going to come today and show us his hands and his side and say, go ahead, handle me. Probably not. But does that mean we have no evidence? We may not have his resurrected body in front of us to touch, as they did. But the same principle applies. Come and see. Examine the evidence and be not faithless but believing. Maybe you like the Ethiopian, like the women, like Thomas, are seeking the truth about a relationship with God, but that barrier of, I can't understand. I can't let go of what I've been May I say programmed to believe? You're stuck at that barrier. 
like the, Philipp, uh, the, the Ethiopian. How can I? I don't know how to get around this. I don't know how to get through this. I want you to know a couple of things. First of all, scripturally, historically, in reality, God's looking for you. He, he knows where you are. He knows your past. He knows your present. He knows your future. He knows right, just like he knew exactly where Thomas was, and he knew what Thomas had said eight days earlier. Just like he knew exactly where the Ethiopian would be when he's reading Isaiah 53. Just like he knew where, to, where, where uh, Philip was to whisper in his ear in such a way that Philip could make that journey and cause Is there anything too hard for the Lord? He knows exactly where you are. He's not angry with you. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. Jesus said in Matthew 11, Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and, what does it say next? Learn of me. Examine the evidence. God also, in spite of knowing you and I, and every mistake and every sin and every ego and every lust and every hate and every prejudice, he still loves us and he still has plans for you. Jeremiah 29, I know the thoughts, the plans, the intentions that I have towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of good and not evil to give you tikva, hope, and expect it in. The very next verse, by the way, says, then you will search for me and find me when you search with all your heart, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord. God is seeking you. There's, a, there's a, a, a historical account of a gal named Hagar, and Hagar was in the wrong place at the wrong time. She was bought as a slave girl. She became Sarah's mis, uh, handmaiden, and Sarah gave up on God for a while, and her faith wavered, and she said, I can't have a baby. I'm going to give you my, my, my slave girl, Hagar, and Abraham, you're going to have a sexual relationship with her, and when she has a baby, it'll be my baby. She's my slave. I can take her. Pretty horrible story, yeah? When she gets pregnant, she gets a little cocky, and Sarah regrets her decision and starts persecuting Hagar. So Hagar runs away. She's in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a desert, about to die. She didn't think through that plan very well. And then the angel of God comes to her and says, Hagar, Hagar, and God gives her God's plan for prosperity and peace and provision. She makes a statement in Genesis 16, 3, Thou, God, seest me. In the middle of nowhere. But notice what she says next, and this is the question every one of us ought to recognize and evaluate. Thou, God, seest me. Have I also looked after him that seeth and seeketh me? God's looking at me. God's looking for me. God's, God's seeking me. Am I really seeking God? Am I interested? God's interested in me, in a relationship with me. Ha am I really interested in God? That's what she's saying. Jeremiah 29, we read a moment ago, I have plans for you. You'll seek me and find me when you search with all your heart, and I will be found of you. God invites seekers. Malachi 3.10 says, prove me now, saith the Lord. Search for me, find me, I'll be there for you. Jesus said, this is why I came, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. God is seeking you, but Satan is seeking to sidetrack you with these barriers. This may be one, this may be one of many that you're going to run into. That's why Isaiah 55 says, why are you laboring for that which isn't going to satisfy? You're seeking in the wrong direction. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. God is seeking you. The reality is you wouldn't be here at such a time as this unless in some way through some set of circumstances God brought you here. God put it in your heart to be here. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to them. It's the same principle here. 
If I come to your door and I'm knocking on your door and you're in there and you may look out the window through the peephole and you may know I'm there, but you may think, well, I'm not ready. My house is a mess. I don't want to see that preacher. I don't. Any number of reasons why you choose not to open the door. How long will I stay there and ring your doorbell or knock? Not very long. The reality is how many times has God rung your bell? In a thousand different ways. It doesn't really matter what litany of excuses we make as to why we're not going to let him in. But this verse says, seek the Lord while he may be found. He's available now. Genesis 6-3, God says, my spirit, however, will not always strive with men. There will be a day I hope it's not today. There will be a day where you will hear for the last time God ring your bell. There will be a day that for the last time God will try to, I'm seeking for you, and you will say, no, not today. And no, when that day passes, when it comes and goes, there will be a day you will look for God. But God will not be there. Proverbs chapter 1, because I called and you refused. Because I lifted up my voice and you wouldn't pay attention. I stretched out my hands, but you rejected me. Then, when your calamity comes as a whirlwind, and desolation and despair come on you, then you'll search for me, but you will not find me. Because you hated knowledge and would not have the fear of the Lord. That's not Pastor Keith speaking. That's God speaking. My spirit will not always strive with men. Over the next number of weeks, Lord willing, we're going to examine some of these barriers and some of the provision that God has made by faith to go right through those barriers, the path of life. Will you join me in this journey? Let's pray together.